In this tutorial, we're going to learn to make this log cabin blanket. Here's a little more of it. This uh, log cabin is tr a traditional quilting technique that's been adapted over the years to both knitting and crocheting. We're going to learn how to make this knit blanket. And for this, uh, we have a pattern you can follow along with. It's available for free over on my website, verypink.com, or you can follow the link that I put in the video description below. Now before we get started, there are three things I want to talk about with this blanket. Um, first up is the size. And I'm giving you instructions for, very specifically, a 47 inch by 63 inch blanket. But it's very easy to adapt by adding more quilt blocks or, or even adjusting the size of the quilt blocks, which look like this. Um, and I've made this, I've designed this pattern to use up leftover bits of yarn from other projects. You can plan out one of these blankets and it looks really cool when the colors are carefully planned. I really just use leftover bits that I had from other projects. Uh, so that's about the size. For the yarn choices, I'm going to recommend that you use, you stick with one fiber type. If you want to make an animal fiber, mostly wool, for example, stick with that. You can also use cotton or other plant fibers or an acrylic blanket. I will tell you this, you will have the best luck with this blanket if you use animal fibers. Now, if you don't have any, don't worry about it. But if you have, um, if you make any kind of tension mistake with this, like you have a bind off that's too tight or stitches that are a little bit loose, animal fibers are going to be really forgiving when you block them out and you'll still end up with nice right angles, which is what this blanket's all about. Um, also, as far as your leftover bits of yarn go, I'm talking about not very much yarn at all. This is 10 yards of yarn, which is enough to work the shortest strip in the quilt block. And this is 30 yards of yarn, just to give you an idea. And this is enough to work the longest strip in the quilt block. So you can measure it out to make sure you have enough for any given strip. But um, just for an idea, this is 10 and this is 30. The last thing I want to mention before we get into the technique are colors. And like I said, you can carefully plan the colors for this blanket or you can just use the leftover bits of yarn that you have. Uh, I did not pay very much attention to what the colors were doing when I put this blanket together. Uh, I did pay attention to a couple of things. I made sure that no single block was dominated by one color. I have a lot of green leftovers. I could have made this whole blanket just different colors of green, but I wanted to shake it up, so I paid attention to that. I also made sure that no single block was really dark or really light, so I tried to mix that up. And I kept really uncomplimentary colors from being next to each other in a block. I just, I did use colors that didn't really match in a single block. They just didn't touch each other. So those are some things to think about. Uh, go ahead and get your free pattern over on my website. And first up, we're going to get started with the center square. We're ready to get started with our first quilt block. And something I forgot to mention in the intro is that for all of you purl stitch haters, there is not a single purl stitch in this whole blanket. It is 100% knit stitch. You know who you are. You're going to like that part of this project. Let's go ahead and take a look at the construction of this. Here's a finished quilt block, and this is unblocked, and so it's a little lumpy and bumpy. We start with this center square here. Cast on 20 stitches, knit for 20 ridges, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Then you bind off and you knit this strip, you bind off and then you knit this strip, you bind off, this is four, this is three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And it's all clear in the pattern, and if this is confusing now, don't worry, it's just a matter of turning the work counterclockwise every time you bind off to knit the next strip, and it's just kind of all laid out in front of you. So the first thing we do is we cast on 20 stitches and knit for 20 ridges. This is a bulky sample. This is a much bigger square than I got when I used worsted weight yarn. This is just for example. Um, let's talk first about what is right side and what is wrong side, because right and wrong side becomes really clear after you're finished with your center square and your first strip. But 
with the um, just the center square knit, I'll show you how I determine what is um, right and wrong side. This is my cast on row here, and this is what I consider the, the right side. It's a nice twill edge to the cast on row. And I did the long tail cast on, and my working yarn, or my tail end ends up over here on the left side. The wrong side of the cast on looks like pearl bumps. So what I did, the reason that's important is because I bound off on the right side. So I cast on, I knit for 20 ridges. Now when we're talking about garter stitch, it's easy to see how many rows you have because you can just count these ridges. And each ridge is actually two rows down and back. If you pull them apart, they look like pearl bump ridges, but if you pull them apart, there is a knit stitch in between there. So it ends up actually being 40 rows, 20 ridges, and then I bound off. And throughout this pattern, the bind off, I want you to do a regular bind off, nothing fancy. And I'll give you a link in the pattern to um, what the regular bind off is in case you need it. A uh, regular bind off is stiff and it's going to provide stability throughout the pattern so it's not just a big stretchy piece of garter stitch. So a regular bind off, we bind all the way off and we leave the last loop. Normally when you bind off you would pull that last loop through and fasten it off. Nope, we need to leave that live. And then you bind off, you turn your work uh, counterclockwise so that your loop is over here on the right side. And this is where we're going to pick up and knit. I've got my needles here, um, and I have the next color of yarn that I want to use, all ready to go. So we're going to pick up stitches between the ridges, and we're going to pick up 20 stitches here. I have this loop in the old color left, up, left on the needle, and if you look between the ridges, this is actually between the cast on row and the first ridge, there's a place where the needle just wants to really easily go. And when you put your needle in there, you'll have two strands up on the needle. I'm going to take my next color of yarn and leaving like a six inch tail, I'm just going to make a loop and put that over the needle and pull it through. And then I'll separate my working yarn from my tail end. And then again between the ridges, kind of up almost into the next ridge, there is a hole there that makes it so easy to pick up a stitch. So I put my needle in there, wrap the needle, lots of tension on the working yarn here, whoops, I just lost it, pull that through and then loosen that stitch up a bit if you, if you pulled the working yarn really tight. So right in there. And if you are worried about whether you're picking up a stitch in the right spot, it doesn't really make that much difference. Um, as long as you're consistent across the whole row, it will look good. Oops. You're going to have to bear with me here. Okay, that should be 19. For the very last one I pick up, I want to pick, well, let me double check. Nope, that was one too many. My last stitch, you would assume, would go right here, but I really want to pick it up as close to the edge as possible. This would be picking it up as I've done on all of these. I'm going to skip that little spot and really kind of go up into the upper knot. And the reason I do that is to even out this edge with the next bit of knitting. I don't want there to be a jog there, and so I try to get things as close to the edge as possible. And now I have 21 inches, on, 21 inches, 21 stitches on the needle because I have this one in the other color and I picked up 20. Now I'm going to turn the work and just knit across. No purling. And the bit that you just picked up, the wrong side row after the first bit that you pick up is always the stiffest row to knit. And it gets easier from here. Okay. 
get all the way down to the last two stitches. One of those stitches will be in the new color, one in the old color, and knit those two together. So I picked up 20 stitches and now I have 20 stitches on the needle. Now we left these two ends loose. We're gonna to get to that here. Turn your work again, and this is how I do, how I finish up attaching my new color. I knit across a few stitches. And the reason I knit across a few is so that there's enough on this right needle so it doesn't fall out. Now you, if you can see here, I have some of the tan showing from that loop, and this is just all kind of loose and ridiculous looking. I'm going to take those two ends and pull them, especially pulling on the tan one. Don't be shy about pulling hard. Pull it until you don't see any more tan in there and the stitches look even. Then I tie a knot with the two ends, like so. And that's not going anywhere. When I go back to weave in the ends, um, this knot will be nice. It won't cause any problems. Now, um, here's the right side of the work. Here's the wrong side of the work. I want to show you, I think this is really pretty, even without the ends woven in yet. If you are consistent with where you pick things up, you end up with what looks really nice and neat on the wrong side of the work. It also becomes really obvious to see what is the wrong side of the work, because all the ridges are on the back and the front is very smooth. Next up, we're going to talk about picking up the second strip. Now I'm gonna show you how to pick up the second strip. You've done the center square and one strip. We're going to pick up the second strip. And after you get this technique down, you're good for the rest of the blanket. There's nothing else for me to show you other than seaming the pieces, the, the quilt blocks together. So let's take a look at this. There's my center square. There's my first strip. And again, with this first strip, I um, pick up the stitches and we covered all that in the last one. And then you just count the ridges and I did 10 ridges and bound off on the right side of the work. There's the wrong side with the, um, the ridge on the back. So we're ready to pick up for the second strip and you, you bind off, turn it counterclockwise and we're ready to go this way. So the thing that's different about this one and it's the only other technique you really need to know is that we're going to be picking up between garter stitch ridges and on a cast, off, uh, a cast on edge, which is a, the same as a bind off edge. That's the, the, um, the only thing you need to know about picking up stitches is it's not all between ridges. For different blocks, we have different um, edges to pick up from. This one happens to be a cast on edge. So let's get started. Again, I've left the last stitch from the first strip. I'm gonna put my needle in just like I did when we picked up for that first strip leave myself about a six inch tail, make a loop, wrap that around the needle, lots of tension on the working yarn, pull that through. And I will pick up 10 along this edge, which will give me 11 on the needle because I've left that first red stitch. Okay, two, four, six, eight, 10, 11. There are 11 on the needle now because I picked up 10. Now we're ready to start picking up in the cast on edge. And I'll tell you, um, there are just enough stitches to pick up, but this very first one in tan, I always have a really difficult time picking it up. So I pick up the first stitch that I see or here in red from the first strip. Now what I'm picking up are two legs, I'm going under two legs of the V. I'm gonna wrap it and pull it through. Now I just did that because it's much easier to pick up than this first tan one. So now going across this tan ridge, I'm going to put my needle under, as I said, both legs of the V. 
wrap it and pull it through just like you did with the garter stitch ridges. And that's it. It's going to be the same all the way across. It's going to be the same for all of the ridges or all of the strips. So I picked up in between the ridges here and I picked up from the cast on edge of the second of the um, center square here. I'm going to do the same thing I did on the first strip for this strip. I'll pick up st stitches up, knit back, and when I get to the last two stitches, I'll knit them together. I'll make sure and pull them tightly to make any trace of the red disappear from this cream color strip and knit for 10 ridges and bind off and then again turn it counterclockwise. And I make it really clear in the pattern just where you are and where, um, where to go after you finish a strip, where, where your next strip will appear. It becomes habit and it gets to be pretty easy the more quilt blocks that you do. Okay, next up we are going to talk about steaming the finished blocks, figuring out placement, and knitting the borders on the blocks. Now that you know all the techniques you need to knit the blanket, let's talk about the bigger picture of putting the whole thing together. Uh, I knit up a whole bunch of quilt blocks before I took the next step to go on and start weaving in ends and thinking about placement and uh, uh, knitting the borders on this. First, let's talk about steaming out the blocks. We are here on my blocking board. You don't have to have a blocking board. You can use an ironing board or whatever else, whatever surface you have that's not going to uh, burn or melt with the iron. And um, the blocking board's nice, ironing boards are nice because you can pin into them. With these blocks that I did, it just so happens that they block out to 13 inches square. And so every time I knit one, I love it when things end up with perfect right angles and everything looks really good. So I spent a lot of time steaming before this blanket was finished. And so I've blocked the, whoops, not quite 13 inches square. Um, so I would pin it out like this, really making sure that my right angles were looking nice and nothing was stretching. And um, let's see what I'm doing here. This piece is unblocked and I don't have an iron here, but the way that I would do this is turn the iron on and since I'm using wool, I can use the highest heat setting, the highest steam setting. Set it on steam and without pressing down, just steam all over, you know, just hitting the steam button and having the steam spray out. And then with wool, I was just able to pat it the way that I want it to be to make sure that it's perfect and straight. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, after I did even just the center square, I would block, I would steam this out to be a perfect square before I started knitting on it. I tell you, I'm a fiend about right angles. <laughs> so I was really careful to make sure that everything was square throughout the whole thing. Also, uh, steaming it will give you an idea if things are going well. For example, if, you, um, if you're really watching your work and making sure that, that things look good, you'll be able to tell right away, for example, if one of your bound, bind off edges is too tight. Then you can go right back and fix that before you go on with your work. Uh, and that's, uh, steaming is actually a way of making sure that your work is looking good. Now, next up we're going to talk about placing, placing the, the, uh, the blocks. And for the blanket, for the 70, for the, sorry, for the 47 by 63 inch blanket, I have uh, 12 blocks total. And I've made this so I can show you about how I've worked the placement on these. I um, have colored in the longest strip, strip number eight, on each one of these little blocks to make it clear. Now instead of arranging them all facing the same direction, you see how I have the colored strip over there on the left side? I decided to kind of make the eye dance around a little bit and not see that much um, pattern. So I twisted them a quarter turn going across like this and down. 
You see how I did that? And then um, when I did that, I would just make sure that I didn't have, you know, like red next to red or um, white next to white. And, that, and so this is, I, I actually set all this out on my bed to make sure that I liked how it looked before I started knitting borders. Because you do need to, to know how you want it set out before you start knitting borders. And I'll tell you the reason for that. Um, we want all of the spaces between the quilt blocks to be exactly 10 ridges. And I, I wanted it set up so that the seam would run exactly between those 10 ridges. So for example, when I knit the border on this square up here, I did five ridges on one side, 10 ridges on this side, 10 ridges on this side, and five ridges on this side so that it would fit together with the rest of the blanket. And to do that, um, I needed to know that this was going to be my upper left blanket. Now let's take a look at um, the piece I have here. This might make it more clear. This is actually the bottom left, is it? Yes, it's the bottom left piece. I'm, I'm still working on that blanket. I still have three more blocks to go. And this needs to be blocked, but uh, you can see here I have five ridges here, five ridges here, because it's going to fit up in this corner here. So it's five ridges, five ridges, ten ridges, ten ridges. And that's what I've got going here, ten ridges, ten ridges. And once you know where they're placed, you know how many ridges to put on each side. And for another example, Here's the piece I'm currently working on. This is the center bottom piece so that it's, it's five ridges here, five ridges here, five ridges here, which I'm still knitting, and ten ridges here. And once I figure out where something's going to be placed, I take a little clippy marker and mark the side that needs ten ridges so I don't forget when I'm watching a movie in my knitting chair. And the borders are knit just like every other strip. You leave an extra stitch, you knit your ridges, you bind off, you turn it a quarter turn, and that's what's going to give you the edges. Now, I used scrap yarn for everything, and I bought this yarn, and I ended up using for this size blanket about 900 yards. The details will all be in the pattern. But um, I'll tell you, as cool as black looks, it made seeming really difficult. If I were to make another one of these, I would probably pick like a Tweety Brown or something instead of this black. I had to sit under a bright light to be able to see what I was doing when I was seaming these pieces together. Anyway, it's all spelled out in the pattern, but that's the idea that you want um, for figuring out how to place these and knitting the borders on each block. And next up, we're going to talk about weaving in the ends on the back of the work. Yes, with this blanket, you're going to have a lot of ends to weave in. Hopefully you don't hate it, but usually I find that when I teach someone the really correct way of weaving in ends, they end up disliking it less. I don't mind doing it. I think it's pretty fun. Uh, let's take a look. Here's a finished quilt block with none of the ends woven in. <laughs> and for those of you who hate weaving in ends, this probably looks like a nightmare. It's not. And I'm going to demonstrate how to do it on this bulky piece here. Now, if you know how to weave in ends already, uh, weaving in in garter stitch is very much like weaving in ends in reverse stockinette on the back of stockinette work. I'm taking my tapestry needle, I'm threading this on there, and I'm going to go under this ridge because I want to weave in the red end in the red area. Okay. Now, if you look at the work, you will see what I call umbrellas and smiles, umbrellas and smiles. And this, like I said, this is just like weaving in ends in reverse stockinette, but if you pull it apart, you'll see there are knit stitches between the ridges. We're going to pretend that these, this is reverse stockinette and there are no knit stitches between the ridges. We're going to treat it that same way. So I want you to come up, I'm going to come up picking up a smile and picking up a smile to get myself away from the very edge of the work. Okay, now I'm going to travel to the right here. 
Now just to where, just to the right of where I came out, there is an umbrella. I'm going to follow the umbrella around and go down into the smile next to it. Angle my needle to the left and go down into the umbrella. I went through a smile and through an umbrella there. Pull that through. Traveling to the right, right next to where I came out, there is a smile. That's hard to see because it's folded up under. There's a smile. I'm going to go up into the umbrella, right next to that smile, angle my needle to the left, and go up into that smile. Pull that through. There's an umbrella. Go down into that smile, angle to the left, go down into that umbrella, pull that through. It's like you're making a figure eight. And if you need a really slow review of this, where I'm using contrasting colors, I'll give you a link here to my video on weaving in ends as well. I usually weave in just a few times like that. I guess I wove it in maybe six times and then cut the end short. And I don't have to worry about that going anywhere because I did tie a nice knot right here. So it was really just a matter of hiding the end. And you can see, you can barely tell that there's anything different going on here than the rest of the piece. And that's the way we want it to work. We want tidy work on the back. Next up, the last bit, we are going to talk about seaming the pieces together. Once you get some blocks finished, it's time to start seaming them together. You'll knit the quilt block and uh, figure out where you want it, knit the borders. And before I forget to tell you this, the easiest way to seam these is to seam a strip, you know, seam them in strips and then seam the strips together. Trying to seam them together um, on different sides at the same time makes it really awkward to fit the pieces together. So maybe you'll get three of these done and seam them together and then knit other projects, wait until you get more leftover yarn together and then knit up some more. The seaming for this is just basic mattress stitch, but there is a little twist because sometimes we're seaming garter stitch ridges, uh, even, most of the time we're seaming bind off row to bind off row, which is easy, but some garter stitch ridges are in there so I wanna show you how to cover that. Let's take a look. These are my bulky samples. Uh, obviously, this is not; these are not finished blocks ready to be seamed together. Um, and I'm going to use a contrasting color so you can see what I'm doing. First, I want to show you how to seam bind off to bind off. And actually, I had it the wrong way. This is bind off to bind off. I'm going to pull that. Okay, I will poke through the very edge here with my tapestry needle. Pull that through, leaving myself a tail to weave in, and go through that same hole again. This is how you'll always start a block. And then jump over to the other piece and go into the very bottom corner there. Okay, now we have the two pieces attached together. Now with the bind off rows, you see it's a, it's a series of V's all the way up. And right below the, the, the V going this way is a V going this way. It's a knit stitch tucked down in there. Put your needle behind both legs of that V and pull it through. You always stay on this side of the work. You're never poking straight through to the back. Jump over to the other piece and pick up the first two legs of the V that you see just below the bind off row over here. I'm not pulling anything tight yet if you notice. I'm going to go into the same hole I came out of, pick up the two V's over here, go into the same hole I came out of, pick up the two V's over here, go into the same hole, two, v, uh, two legs of the V, I mean. You see how easy this part is? And the reason I leave it loose, there are two reasons I leave it loose. One is um, it makes it easy to see where I came out of last time to pick up the two legs of the V on each side. And the other is that I like to leave it a little bit so that I can have what I always call the magic moment. I love this. When you pull it together and it looks so awesome <laughs> and the, you can't even see the white colored yarn, can you? It just looks so good. 
now I actually need to take this out so I can show you how to seam bind off row to garter ridges, which you never have to do very much of, but it does happen. Okay. So I'm going to get it started the same way, going through twice over here, jumping over here, and going through the very edge there. Now, doing the mattress stitch on this side is just the same. I'll pick up two legs of the V just under the bind off row, and then I'll jump over here. I'm also going to pick up two things, two legs over here. One of them is kind of hidden between the ridge, and one of them is the ridge. I'll show you that again. Go into the same hole I came out of and pick up two. Go into the same hole I came out of, pick up what was between the ridge and the ridge. This, um, the thing that's, you're going to go into the same hole and, you'll, and you pull your needle up and you'll come up with something that is kind of behind and then the ridge you see is there in front. I would say the most important thing, if you're having a difficult time finding what I'm talking about, the most important thing is to make sure that you are working, whatever you're picking up is a straight line and you're not dipping into the work and coming back out because that will keep your edges from being straight. Magic moment. And that looks really good. I can even pull that a little tighter. And that's how you're going to seam the pieces together. Again, the free pattern is available over on my website, verypink.com. Good luck.